Uh, so I'll start with a problem, which I think is hopefully somewhat um, intuitive, which is, you know, we run a subscription business at Netflix. So, you know, people sign up to use our service. They sign up for uh, basically months at a time. And so what's strangely difficult is working out what an acquired member is worth, um, you know, to the business in terms of money. Let me just actually maximize this. Uh, and so, you know, the reason you want to do this is if you run a business, you know, you have a lot of basically MBAs or business people around and one very easy way to run a business, and I'm not trying to be um, sort of mean about it, is basically you get the MBAs to basically calculate net present value correctly or, you know, doing cost benefit analysis and you just basically green light net present value projects. The difficulty in this is like for a subscription business, costs of projects are easily measured. So think about a marketing campaign, you have to pay for a billboard. Um, and then you kind of, it's hard enough to work out what, how many people actually join because of that billboard. And then moreover, you need those benefits or those, the, the sort of the value of those acquisitions to be denominating dollars so you can actually do cost benefit analysis. So it's a somewhat like important or very important problem and somewhat tricky to actually um, handle in practice. So let's start off with this example. Like I said, you know, we pay for some billboard. We have some way of causally measuring how many people uh, sign up because of that billboard. And this problem is a bit interesting because I think it's not really studied because it seems like there are very easy, trivial solutions to the problem. So the obvious one, if you if you kind of work in industry or if you even think about the problem a bit is basically, you know, we have these customer lifetime value models, which are basically, you know, the expectation of like the discounted um, revenue from a member. And so you have these models. So in theory, what you could do is, you know, you have a predictive model, you know, someone shows up on service, they signed up because of the billboard. And so you say, okay, what does the model say about the LTV of that member? And you say, okay, if I have a hundred members, you score the LTV and you say, okay, that's how much money we got from those members. Um, the difficulty with that is, or the, the, I guess the fundamental problem with that is, you know, if there's some possibility that those members or some of the members would join up next period, then you're sort of like overestimating uh, the value of the billboard. So imagine the billboard gets people to sign up, you know, hundred people to sign up, but all of those people would have signed up, you know, next month, then it's clearly an overestimate. If you say, if you attribute all the LTV um, to that, to those members upon sign up. And so then you go the complete other direction, which is, you know, you're very pessimistic and you say, okay, whatever, hundred people signed up, um, all we're getting is, all we're guaranteeing is basically one month of the subscription price for each of those uh, acquired members. But then if you think about that, that sort of solution as well, you know, status quo buys, or if your product is very good, either one implies that members, the ones that signed up are less likely to churn the non-members are to stay non-members. Basically, you know, a member is more likely to make a sort of rejoin or stay on service decision than a non-member is to make that decision. So that one month subscription price answer is also like downwards bias. So what is the solution? You know, it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm just gonna skip this because I, I wasted my time. So I'm just gonna give you not the technical details, I'll give you the straight out intuition. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's some details obviously in the paper, but you know, there's this movie called Sliding Doors with Gwyneth Paltrow and it's a kind of very weirdly causal inference type um, movie where she has two forks, she has a fork in the road type, kind of moment in her life where either she catches the train or she misses the train. And in the upper parts, you know, this is the movie, or you actually see both parts of her life in the movie. So in that, that first fork where she catches the train, she actually um, gets home early enough to catch her husband cheating on her. And, you know, 
it's a horrible first period, but actually her life is like much better thereafter because, um, you know, she, she, there's like fundamental issues in the relationship and she has a very happy life. Now the second fork in the road, which is the bottom half is she misses a train, never catches her husband cheating on her and has a horrible life. And so this like very causal inference way of looking at like a life you can kind of sort of see what is the value of sort of pushing Gwyneth Paltrow onto the train, which is um, going to be basically the difference in say expected utilities. So integrating all over all the future paths up at the top minus uh, the expected utility, which is integrating over the, all the expected utilities on the bottom path over her, um, you know, over that, over that path as well. So the idea is, Obviously, this analogy is a bit stupid, but the idea is this analogy is supposed to represent sort of like what is, you know, someone, what is the value of someone joining the Netflix train and what happens if they don't join the Netflix train? And obviously, in the bottom path, you know, the, the idea of the, the value of a non member or the value of like not catching the train is very important. So, like LTV is basically the upper half. And so, the point here is you're supposed to care about, uh, you know, value of a sort of non-member and so that you know I'll, I'll set up some definitions i don't i don't think i have that much time to go through them i don't but i want to just go through this there's some causal foundations of how to make this causal what assumptions are required to make it causal i'll skip them and so i just want to talk about this point which is okay so if you have a quick and dirty model so v here is going to be basically expected discounted um uh, lifetime revenues from a single member and so if you just start off with a very simple world where there's probability P of uh, someone joining the service and you say LTV sub M is the kind of like discounted revenue from someone who joins the service, you can just set up this very easy sort of definition or like this solution, which is, okay, what is LTV of a non-member? And it's basically you're saying, okay, in every period, there's some probability that that non-member joins at that period and you get LTVM. And so basically the probability of joining after K periods is simply the probability of failing K, failing to join K times and joining the, like after that. It's a geometric series. You sort of like take that solution. You can kind of like end up with this solution, which is LTV of a non-member is basically equal to some fraction of LTV as, as a member. Plug in some very like trivial, like, you know, like simple sort of realistic numbers, you know, it's a very simple model. Um, and you get the fact that LTV of a non-member is basically 84% um, of LTV of a member. So if you're calculating the value of acquisition and you don't subtract off the value of a non-member, you're roughly seven times off. So if you do that kind of like common industry thing of like, let's multiply acquisitions by LTV, you're roughly seven times off. And so the the part of the paper is like, okay, how are you going to estimate LTV of a non-member? Like you don't track non-members, like maybe your Facebook, you track non-members, but like at Netflix, we don't. And so what we do is we show in the paper that if you set up this kind of like Markov chain describing how people flow through non-member to member and all the passages they take through your service, you can kind of get a quite nice estimate of LTV for a non-member, which you can write as a Bellman equation, uh, I mean, there's technically no, no maximization optimization here, but um, you know you could write it that way if if you wanted to, and you basically solve for this value, you know, so for, solve for the value function, and then the value of an acquisition is goes basically going to be like the, the difference in value functions between the state where someone's a member and the state where someone is not a member. So I think I'll leave it at. That. At that, um, there's many more details in the paper, but I'm uh, happy to take questions if you have them. Oh, uh, thank you very much. You actually have five more minutes for your oh. talk. It's okay. 15 minutes. Oh. Ah, ah, yeah. I, I, lost, I, lost, I lost track of where I've started. So, uh, okay, so I, have, I, I, I sped through that. So I'm gonna actually do this then. Yeah, All right, yeah. so let's do let's let since I gave the high level overview, I want to give the technical um, description, which is okay. We'll call V basically the sort of value from a member, which is going to be the discounted revenue. So 
K is you know an indicator for time, beta is the discount rate, M is a membership indicator, and C is basically the sort of money you get from a member. And so, all right, so how do we make this causal? Because we want to make a causal statement of how much additional money do we, did we get? So borrowing heavily from causal inference, let's talk about potential outcomes. So think of there being, you know, potential outcomes VM and V uh, not M, which is basically the potential outcome, potential LTVs of a member and non-member respectively. So observed LTV is just gonna be one of these, you know, defined by the switching equation. So I, if you're a member, I'll observe your uh, LTV when you're a member. And obviously you still have LTV of a non-member even though I'll never observe it. And so technically what we wanna estimate is this equation here, 2.3, which is the difference in, LT, difference in expected potential outcomes Again, this is like very causal inference. And so, so far, because we don't observe both, like we're for a single household or for a single person, you only, observe, you only observe one of these. You don't observe like the two forks in the road. You only like only one fork eventuates. So you only see one of them. And so how do you get around this? So again, borrowing from causal inference, first thing you need is um, overlap, which is basically you need from any state, you need to see transitions from membership and non into membership and non membership. And then, probably more importantly, assumption two, you need unconfoundedness, which is going to be an assumption that uh, membership or non membership is independent. So, the potential outcomes of the LTV are independent to the membership state, conditional on um, the other states that you have in the state space. So the idea is basically you have enough state, you have enough richness in the state space that if I find out you're a member, that doesn't tell me that you say have like, you know, higher um, potential outcomes of both member and non-membership. So for instance, an example is if membership typically selects for high income households who also, you know, churn less and therefore have higher potential LTVs, uh, there has to be something in the state that tells you about income. Otherwise, you know, when you're calculating this difference in LTVs of membership and non-membership, you're really just like doing it, you're, you're selecting for high income households. Um, uh, and if those assumptions hold, you basically go from 2.5, um, you know, sorry, from the previous equation to something with 2.5, where if you look at the left-hand side, you can't estimate you don't actually have a, you know, you don't actually observe the potential outcome VM. Whereas on the right hand side, you're basically taking the expectation of, um, you know, data that you actually observe. So you, you, you've gone from trying to have a, having a definition of the thing you care about in terms of uh, variables that you don't observe into an expectation over variables you do observe. So, you know, you have non-parametric identification and you basically can estimate the whole thing. Like I said, the trouble is going to be this expectation of um, the value of a non-member, um, which you know you don't observe non-members, you don't track them out off your service, you know, out in the wild. But the point of the paper is, if you set up these Markov chains, then you can basically um, uh, get an estimate for it. Um, I think. Okay, and the final thing I'll talk about is, okay, um, you know, Markov chain is somewhat uh, sort of limiting because, you know, of the curse of dimensionality. You, so you have the tension between unconfoundedness, which you're trying to make the cause of something's hold, and then the curse of dimensionality, you don't want the sort of transition matrix to blow up. And so we have these two extensions in the paper that we talk about, which is sort of going beyond sort of like the sort of vanilla Markov chains. And so they largely, center around sort of delineating like what is a state and what is a covariate. And so once, basically, if you're serious about what a state is, like a state is basically um, the set of variables where you kind of like care about transition. So we talked about membership to non-membership, you can talk about sort of low engagement users to high engagement users, um, whereas covariates are more about sort of conditioning so that the assumptions hold. And so we have these two solutions. I'll talk more about the last one just quickly. Basically, you can just add an additional state, we'll call it like a magical state, it's gonna be a propensity score, um, that summarizes just enough to make unconfoundedness hold. And the amazing thing is 
there you're basically just adding one state to the state space so you know you don't you don't have to blow up your state space you know to make unconfoundedness whole because you know you're trying to condition on everything you can collapse that all down to a propensity score and just inject the sort of propensity score and the transitions between propensity scores into the state space um, and you're fine okay i think um, i'm good now okay okay yeah. you're exactly on 15 minutes perfect uh yeah does anyone uh have questions for alan i have uh i have a question uh, mm. when you wrote the bellman equation and you solved yeah. for uh for v uh kind of two questions first of all is how many states does this chain have approximately in practice uh, yeah, I mean, it, dep it depends okay. on like, uh, you know, I'll give it, I'll give ex an example of like states. So you like, typically you have, like, think about like just generically a string. So let's think about Spotify, Mem you have, mem you have membership or non-membership. You probably have like plan, plan type. You probably have like re region. You probably have like level, en level engagement. Um, you have like probably, I don't know, you know, just think about like so that's already four and so each of them they're four sort of like dimensions each with probably like say you know depending on how you cut the bins like say like five or six you probably have tenure how like how long people have been on service so it can blow up quickly and so the point is like which of those do you actually care about which of those are actually just conditioning like do you care about transitions between low tenure and high tenure probably not you care about like differences in engagement. Like if I make you watch more, what does that do to the value? If I make you a non-member talk member, I care about that. If I get you into a higher plan, I care about that. Like, I, so you, the point is like, what transit, what state transitions do you care about versus what is just conditioning? Like a country, for instance, defining the country is really just because I want the transition matrix to be specific for a country. I don't care, mm -hmm. but there's no, there's no real transitions between countries. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, and the, my second question is like a bit technical. How do you like do the inversion? Do you use like some power method or uh, something uh, like this that? One, this one. This one. So, this one because there's no maximization. You can literally just write like two point eight and invert yeah, the yeah. matrix. Yeah. Uh, but how do you do? How do you how do you solve the how do you solve the equation? Do you do like a power iteration like computationally, or you <coughs> no, just invert just the matrix? Okay, so there's like multiple ways. Literally for this one, if the matrix the, the matrix like P is small enough, you can just invert that, invert. Invert, invert that matrix. But yeah, when it gets large, we do power iteration. So we do power iteration and we actually use like this, I'm not sure if you guys know about JAX, which is mm -hmm. like a it's sort of like a very fast, uh, there's kind of like an experimental loop in there, which basically makes, it gets very complicated because once you have N dimensional states, like, it's not like you can just write the trans, you know, it's hard to write the states because the transitions between the states encode a lot of business logic of like, okay, it's not, a, it's not a dense matrix. It's just like a lot of zeros everywhere. And um, like Jax, so I guess technically like, I mean, you could write it in NumPy if you wanted to, but like there's, there's some nice stuff in Jax that speeds it up. But yeah, okay. it, it can get yeah, quite yeah. tricky. Yeah, 